comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. As we hear the word of God, faith is raised up in our hearts and we are transformed. You know, there was a man called Nicodemus, the Bible tells us about in the Gospel of John chapter 3 from verses 1 and Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus as Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and comes to, um, and comes to uh, speak with Jesus. The Bible says he comes at night. He was a ruler of the Jews. He was one of the Sanhedrin, one of the main ruling Jews in Israel. But um, Jesus was not accepted and not believed in by some of the leaders. But we know that this man had an inquiring mind. He knew that Jesus was different. He, he, he knew about the miracles. And he came to see Jesus by night, we understand, because he didn't want the other rulers to know he was going there and going to talk to Jesus. So he came to Jesus kind of like we might say incognito, but disguised, came to talk to him at night. And Jesus spoke to him and said, Nicodemus, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he told him again, he said, except a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Well, Nicodemus didn't understand. He said, how can these things be? He said, uh, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? And Jesus said, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. He's speaking about a spiritual rebirth, not a physical rebirth, not reincarnation. He was speaking about a, a, a spiritual rebirth. He said, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. He said, I, I say unto you, marvel not. You must be born again. And so Nicodemus heard Jesus. And we know that when Jesus was crucified, Nicodemus and another disciple of Jesus among, amongst the rulers and leaders of the Jews, Joseph of Arimathea, came and took the body of Jesus and they uh, buried him and they uh, took care of all the needs there uh, as they were wealthy and influential people. Um, uh, Joseph went to uh, Pilate and asked for the body. He didn't even bother with the priest. He went straight to Pontius Pilate and he said, I want this body, I'll, I'll take care of it. And he did. But you know, these men, because they heard the word of God, their mind and their thinking was changed and transformed. And each one of us, when we hear the word of God, our minds are changed. Uh, if we allow that, true repentance takes place up here when we change our thinking. And Jesus continually said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Luke chapter 19, there's another man who has an encounter with Jesus. And this man was a notorious sinner, so we believe. He was Zacchaeus, and he was uh, short of stature, the Bible says. And, you know, that's difficulty in a crowd. You can't see what you're trying to see. And uh, there was a big crowd coming around Jesus, so when he saw which way he was going, we hear that Zacchaeus ran ahead, and he climbed up a tree waiting for Jesus to come past that way so he could see him clearly. But Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And you know the tax collectors collected money. And, uh, you know, people say sometimes people are okay until you touch their money, you know. And he was, a, he was a tax collector and he collected Jewish money. As a Jewish man, Jesus said he's also a son of Abraham. As a Jewish man, he was collecting money for the Romans. And tax collectors generally were despised and also generally they were crooks. And they took more of the money and they made themselves very, very wealthy as a result of uh, being a tax collector. They collected a lot on the side and became very wealthy. Well, Zacchaeus was no difference. different. He was a very rich man, we understand, from the Bible. And uh, as Zacchaeus is waiting for Jesus, he, had a, he must have had such a desire in his heart to be different, to meet this man of God, to meet this great prophet he'd heard about, this man who was doing all the miracles, th this man who the Bible says... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. People literally hung on his word. When Jesus comes, as he walks under the tree where Zacchaeus is up, he says, come down, Zacchaeus. 
He says, I'm coming to your house today. I'm coming to stay with you. Well, he came down and he received him gladly. And there was lots of people, apparently notorious sinners there. You know, Jesus said, they criticized him for that. They said, this man, how can he be a man of God? He hangs around with notorious sinners. I'm glad he did. I'm so glad he did. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't be here today. Amen? But he, 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 they, they criticized him. They said, he, he eats with sinners. And Jesus said, it's the sick who need a doctor, not the well. And he uh, spoke with them. And as Zacchaeus fellowship with Jesus, heard Jesus, he was completely transformed. Suddenly, he jumps up in his house and he says, today, he says, I give half of everything I have to the needy, the poor. Wow. You know, he had a lot. And he, he's going to now give half. And he said, if I've wronged anyone, he said, I'll re repay them four times as much. He said, I'm going to give back anything that I've taken wrongly. And Jesus then said, salvation has come to this house today. Zacchaeus received salvation that day, he said, because he's also a son of Abraham. And so Zacchaeus was transformed. Hearing Jesus, being in the presence of Jesus, being with Jesus completely transforms us. It's interesting in the book of Acts, we read about Peter and John going to prayer. And when they went there, we know that a man got healed who'd never walked. And then they preached a, uh, an amazing sermon. And thousands of people came to know the Lord after that. And it says the priests, when they looked at them, it says they took note, the confidence of Peter and John, and took note that they'd been with Jesus. I believe that we are going to be completely transformed when we repent. Now, when we talk about repentance, everybody always thinks of the negative side. They think about all the sins and all the wrong things we're doing. But you know, the word repent in the New Testament didn't mean that. It, it, it's the Greek word metaneo, and it simply means change your mind. You know, the way we're going to be completely different, the, may, the way that we're going to be completely better, is when we change our mind and think the right thoughts. You know, many years ago, I spoke to someone, and they said, have you repented of all your sins? And I said, well, I believe so. When I came to Christ, I repented of my sins. They said, oh, but have you ever seen a fortune teller? Have you repented of that? Or, well, I hadn't actually ever been to see a fortune teller. Uh, Gypsy Lee didn't live in Africa. So I'd never been to a, a, a fortune teller. But I had been to the witch doctor a couple of times. And he'd thrown a few bones and, and told my fortune. You know, as a youth, I was about 18, 19, and we are sort of out on some kind of drinking holiday. You know, as sometimes young people do. They go off and we, we had, you know, uh, too many beers, forgot, who, you know, all sorts. Anyway, but, but I went to see the witch doctor at Kariba. And he was probably just a tourist attraction, really, anyway. But um, uh, he, and, th and then you think about that. But you know what? When you say, Lord, forgive me my sins, you mean all of them, don't you? You don't mean, we can't, I mean, some of us, like Zacchaeus, we were notorious sinners. You can't remember them all. <laughs> you know, we, what if we didn't confess this one? or that? When, when we say, God, please forgive all my sins, he doesn't say, I'm going to forgive you, except going to see the witch doctor at Kariba. Or at Great Zimbabwe Ruins. Or something like that, which was the other time. But... He forgives all our sins. But the, the point is that we don't get focused just on the sins because God forgives our sins. What he said was metaneo, change your mind. You'll be a completely different, alive, vibrant, blessed person. Amen. You're going to be transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's some people who are just so inspiring. And that's great. And I, I believe that that's how all of us are going to be because we're going to be full of the Holy Spirit, transformed and changed. Well, just a little bit of time with Jesus. He'd been maybe a crook before. He'd take, he must have taken extra money from people because otherwise he wouldn't be saying, I'll pay it back fourfold. 
So he's going to pay back four times as much, plus he was going to give half of what he had to those who had need. I'm sure there were a lot of happy people that day. But he had spent time with Jesus, and spending time with Jesus, he was a much better person. He was a happy man. You know, some people are a good influence, aren't they? They're a good influence, and, and I believe that's what we are all going to be, a blessing. You see faith, and their lives were changed. He didn't even have to tell Zacchaeus. You know, Zacchaeus, you're a crook. You wanted to change. He said, I want to put it right. Amen. Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verse 7, he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. You know, most people can't believe that because it just seems like impossible. But you know what Jesus said is possible. But when we spend time with Jesus, our desires are going to be changed. They're going to be the right desires. Amen? We're going to desire and want that which is right. He said, you'll ask what you desire and it will be done for you. He said, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so you will be my disciples. Being the disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, disciple, the, the word disciple comes from the word discipline. And it's being disciplined to the teachers of the master. And Jesus is the master, and we are the disciples, and we become disciplined to his teaching. And when we become disciplined to his teaching, we become like him. The Bible tells us in 1 John that as he is, so are we in this world. I believe if we're like Jesus, we're better. Amen? I really do. If we're like Jesus, we are better. Now, I want to read this parable from the Word of God, from Mark chapter 4, the Gospel of Mark chapter 4, and it's known as the parable of the sower, the sower sowing the seed. So, reading Mark chapter 4 from verse 3, Mark chapter 4 from verse 3, the Bible says there, Jesus said, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed, some seed fell on the wayside. The was saying, some seed fell on the road, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground, where it did not have much earth. And immediately it sprang up, but because it had no, earth, no depth of earth, uh, immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it. And it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground. And yielded a crop that sprang up and increased and produced some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What we hear, got to get that H in as a Yorkshireman, what we hear is very important. Because, you know, if I'd spent all my life in Halifax, I'd have just been saying what we hear is important without the H. So. <laughs> but anyway... What we hear is incredibly important because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, uh, uh, by the word of God. And we can be greatly influenced by the things we hear. You can hear the, the news. Um, my pastor used to say that when he watches TV, he said, I watch two things. He said, I watch the sport and I watch the news. He says, the sport makes me angry. He said, But the truth is that what we hear is very powerful and has an effect on us. And we need to, Jesus said, take care what you hear. Take care what you hear. It's very, very important. You know, our ears are always open. Our, our eyes have eyelids so we can shut them. And, you know, sometimes we see people shut them. They, they, they're not happy with what they're seeing. They go like this. Our, our eyes 
have lids. We don't have to look everywhere. But our ears have no cover. We're constantly hearing. And we need to take care that what we hear and what we set ourselves to hear is that which is good and will build us up and will uh, transform us and especially from the word of God which will give faith and cause us to overcome. Amen. So in Mark chapter 4, it, he, he gave this um, parable, the Lord Jesus. And then they asked him to explain the parable afterwards. The disciples asked the parable. And in verse 13 of Mark 4, verse 13, Jesus said to them, Do you not understand the parable? He said, How then will you understand all the parables? They needed to have understanding of the word of God. And so he says, these ones by the wayside or on the road where the, where, where the word is sown, they hear. They hear the word of God, he said. And Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Now there are many people like that. We might pass through life, we might speak to someone, they might hear. But you know what? Satan's job always is to steal the word of God from us. He wants to steal the word out of our hearts. That's what he does. It says Satan comes immediately to steal the word, uh, to take away the word that was sown in their hearts. And uh, if, if the word is in us, it'll be powerful and effective. And we will be transformed when we hear the word, believe it, act upon it. We're going to be completely transformed. But there are many people who hear the word and they don't really understand or they don't, they're not open to it or they they're stubborn or have a hard heart immediately taken away from them. I remember one night before I, uh, I went to Bible school in America, I was working at the Salisbury Airport on immigration in Rhodesia, in Africa. And there was a man working with me and he said, uh, so you're a believer, are you? Tell me. And so I began to tell him and I could see he was really interested in the, in the kingdom of God. And I, uh, I could see that I needed to press him, would you like to receive Jesus that night? But I didn't. And you know, a couple of days later when we were working on a shift together again, I spoke to him, but I found that it had completely been stolen away. And that he kind of hardened his heart and was now resistant. Whereas before he was open, now he was resistant. And you know, the enemy wants to do that. He wants to steal the word of God away. And that happens. And these kind of people, they hear the word of God, but they never take action upon it. But Jesus spoke in this parable about four kinds of people who hear the word. Firstly, the first one, they hear the word and immediately Satan steals it away. But the second kind he mentioned, he said, um, he said, yeah, verse 16, he says, These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, Immediately they receive it with gladness. They receive it with gladness. The people who hear the gospel about the word of God and they receive gladness, the Bible says. It says, but, but they have no root in themselves and they endure for a time. Stony ground, no root, and they only endure for a time. I want you to say with me, that's not me. Amen. We're not the people who hear and we receive it. Some people, they actually come to church or we meet them or we share the word of God with them and they receive it and, and they laugh and they say, this is the greatest thing ever. This is the truth. I love it. But they're temporary. And that's not us, is it? We're not going to be temporary. We're gonna, we've got the, the, the cross of Jesus and our eyes are fixed on him and we, we're looking to him, and we're going to serve him all our days. Amen. On earth. But these ones are temporary. It says they, when they, uh, they receive it, it's like they do become Christians, but they're for a while. They're temporary. They receive it with gladness, but they have no root in themselves, so they, only endure, they endure only for a time. Afterwards, when tribulation comes, or persecution arises for the word's sake, Immediately they stumble. They fall away. When the difficult times come, they're just off. They're, they've left. They're out of there. <laughs> they checked out. 
And that's not us. We here, we in the house of the Lord forever, as David said. He said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. I heard one Salvation Army officer say one time, he said, Salvation Army, he says they have many good qualities. And when they started, like most church groups, were amazing and great. And it was all about salvation, bringing people to Christ. They'd, but they had a social side, which was so wonderful, helping people and looking after them. But they were really great. But he said, one thing that he noticed which came in was they were always preaching about backsliding. He said, and as a result, everybody backslid. <laughs> he said, but, you know, what we need to do is we need to preach the truth. The Salvation Army officer was telling me, and preach Jesus. He said, and when people get their eyes focused on Jesus, they're not going to fall. You know, it's like Peter um, is an example. He said, keep your eyes fixed uh, on the, well, the Apostle Paul said it, on the author and finisher of your faith. But Peter, when he walked on the water, when Jesus said, come to me, come. He said, let me come to you on the water if it's you. Because at first they thought it was a ghost walking on the water. Then they heard his voice and they were kind of reassured. But Peter said, if it's you, let me come to you walking on the water. And the Bible says he walked on the water. Only man I've ever heard of walking on water besides Jesus. But he walked on the water. But then the Bible says, then he looked and he... He saw the wind and the waves and he became afraid and he began to sink. While he had his eyes fixed on Jesus, he was okay. He was walking on the water. But when he looked at the circumstances, it must have entered his mind that you can't, you can't walk on water when it's windy. <laughs> That's how I look at it. You can't walk on water when it's windy. He began to sink. He saw the storm. Maybe if it had been blue sky and you know, beautiful weather and the Sea of Galilee was completely calm. He wouldn't have been afraid, but suddenly entered his mind, in a storm you can't walk on water. <laughs> so he began to sink. And uh, he said, Lord, save me. And Jesus said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And uh, he began to sink. So we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. But there are hearers, first kind, who immediately God is stolen away from them. And they fall away quickly. The second kind, they receive it with joy. They say, this is the truth. This is what I've always been looking for. This is great. But then as soon as difficulties come along, they fall away. I want you to say, I'm not like that. Amen. And then it says, now these are the ones, this is the third kind, these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. They hear the word, they receive it, so these are Christians too, like the first lot, but not, not necessarily just temporary, but sown among thorns, there's so many other things in there. They're the ones who hear the word, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. It is possible to be a Christian, but to not be a fruitful Christian. And we need to be transformed from being unfruitful to fruitful because that's a blessing to God. And these three things in particular Jesus mentioned, and Jesus is the creator of the universe, so he knows what he's talking about. He says the cares of this world. So many cares of this world entered in, and so now they're not productive Christians because they're too worried about so many things. Amen. And we've got to keep our eyes on the Lord and in his word. And then he says, the other thing is the deceitfulness of riches. You know, the deceitfulness of riches, it attacks people who have money, loads of it, and it attacks those who don't have it. You know, some people are so worried about having money that they, even if they don't have it, they're, they're never really effective because that's always what's consuming them. And other people have a lot of money at some point, but the deceitfulness of it and all the worries of it takes them away. You know what? God is more than that. And I don't believe God doesn't want us to have money. I believe he wants to bless his people. But we need to put everything in perspective. We need to put everything in perspective. It's, not, it's about God. You know, um, some people, like I've been, I was watching Billy Graham, a couple of his sermons. What a great preacher Billy Graham was. What a wonderful man of God. But um, you know what? There were thousands of people in those stadiums hearing the gospel. 
but it took a lot of money in order to bring that about. You know, there's a lot of money happening there. But I don't believe for a minute that Billy Graham's heart was caught up in the money. I don't believe that. I believe Billy Graham's heart was caught up in the gospel. And the money furnished what was necessary to rent a stadium and whatever was necessary to bring about a great outreach and many people coming to Christ. But there's the deceitful... I think that Zacchaeus escaped that. You know, he could still be wealthy. Um, there's, you know, some people misinterpret these things and um, the Bible says that Jesus said that it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's harder for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. But then, these were Jews, you know, and Jews like money. They like making money. And they went, ah, who then can be saved was their next answer. Because their thoughts as Jewish people was, if you're godly, you get rich. That was the Jewish thinking, because Abraham was the wealthiest man of his time. So was Isaac, so wealthy that the Philistines envied him. Jacob had a great um, uh, thing. David, King David, and many of them. This is how Jews thought. That they thought if, if you're godly, God blesses you. But Jesus was saying, it's not about that. It's not about that. It's about putting God first in all things. Amen. Putting God first in all things. Amen. The Jews expected to be blessed. So, so it says the deceitfulness of riches can enter in and choke the word of God, making it fruitful. And then the other thing he mentioned was the desire for other things. You know, with most people, there can be just plain distraction. Just plain distraction. I love cameras, one man told me. I love computers. I love mobile phones and most of my life is spent doing those things or it can be anything else, boats on the lake or, or whatever. But people can be distracted from the things of God. I, I don't think there'll be a more exciting life ever than putting Jesus first in everything. I believe. So he said, desire for other things, enter in and choke the word. So the first kind of person that Jesus mentioned was they hear the word of God like it's by the roadside, and then their heart's quite hard, they hear it, just goes off and they forget it, it's like Satan comes and steals it, the birds of the air come and eat the seed up and take it away. The second kind was on stony ground. They, they receive the word of God, they believe it, they're immediately filled with joy straight away, but they don't have any root. I think we need to get root in us. Amen? We need to get rooted and grounded in the things of God. Amen. In the truth of God's word. So they didn't have any root. They were only temporary. When difficult things came, they couldn't resist the devil. They couldn't uh, overcome the circumstances because they had no root. But then, <coughs> but then there was the ones who were distracted by the riches of this world, the desire for other things. But then he said, but these are the ones sown on good ground who hear the word. They hear it, they accept it, and they bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100-fold. Now, this fourth kind, I believe, are the blessed um, Christians who 100% give their hearts and lives to serve God. The, th the third kind, I believe, covers most Christians, 99%, where distraction, desire for other things, enter in and choke the word. I believe that's most Christians. The fourth kind is the kind where they are 100% committed to God and uh, so they can receive from God and be a blessing. I remember, I never remember, uh, I mean I never remember, I never forget <laughs> of the words I read that Smith Wigglesworth said. He said, God will pass over a million people to touch one person who has faith. God will pass over a million. So there isn't even a million people on the file. I think we're about 300,000 or so, 350,000. A million's a lot of people. There isn't even a million people in Preston and Blackpool. Maybe it's getting close to that, but Preston, uh, Blackpool, 
and uh, Lancaster, something more. It's a lot of people, isn't it? A million. A lot of people. And Smith Wigglesworth said, God will pass over a million people to touch one person who has faith. I mean, reading the life of Wigglesworth, you have to conclude he's one in a million. You know, he, he's, he was exceptional. He was outstanding. Why? Because he was so committed to God. He thought about God. He loved God. I heard of one man who had a conversation with him in a car. Um, you know, it, those were in like the 1940s and the 1930s. Uh, cars were, uh, I don't think, as comfortable as they are today. Certainly not as fast as they are today. But Wigglesworth was still impressed. I mean, this is better than going on horse. So, um, so he, he, they were talking about the car, and suddenly Wigglesworth took his hat off, and he said, Lord, I've forgotten about you for 20 minutes. Apologize, Lord, and he began to pray. His heart was set on the Lord. His heart was set on him. And I believe that's what we really do need to do, is set our hearts on him. Amen. Father, I pray, Lord, today that, Lord, that we will, Lord, hear your word, believe it, and as the word of God says here, hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. Lord, we don't want to be unfruitful, but fruitful for you. And we pray, Lord, that today we will be so transformed from this hour, Lord, that we will bear fruit a hundredfold, and give glory to God, I pray, in every way. And today I just want to, want to say as I, I, I pray that um, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, today's the day. Today's the best day. The, the Word of God says, now is the day of salvation. Now is the time to receive Jesus. So let's pray and say, Lord, I ask you to forgive me from going my own way, leaving you out of my life for ignoring you. And right now, Lord, I choose to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. And I open wide my heart and my life and my mind and say, come into my life, Lord Jesus. Be my Lord and Savior. I receive you today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, today's a great day to live for God. Amen.